Hi, Mike Amundsen here, and I want to talk to you more about APIs in depth. This is the series where we spend a little bit more time talking about some basic details of APIs and how you can use them. And in this uh, episode, I want to talk about something in particular, and that is what's called the web design maturity model. Now, this actually came up uh, recently. I was in a, a conference just this past week, and someone was talking about the idea of design first and code first and several other things, and this came up, so this model came up. So I was actually kind of uh, happy to see it, and I thought this would be a great time to talk a little bit about it. First of all, this is me. This is how you find me on LinkedIn and GitHub and Twitter and YouTube. I'd love to hear more from you, hear more about what you're working on, the kinds of things you were doing, and what is interesting to you about APIs. So in, in this screencast, I want to talk about this notion of the WED API design maturity model. I'm going to start from a pretty familiar place for a lot of API uh, builders, Richardson's maturity model for APIs, and get a little background on that, and then that'll lead us ahead. And then I want to talk about this notion I have about a design maturity model for APIs. So it isn't just a runtime model, but it's also design. How are we approaching this idea of designing the APIs? And in particular, I want to focus on the difference between internally driven model design and externally driven uh, modeling when you're designing. And we'll talk about the, the power and the challenges of each. But first, I want to talk a little bit about uh, Leonard Richardson and his uh, maturity model. So Leonard gave this fantastic talk in 2008 at a QCon event called Justice Will Take Us Millions of Intricate Moves. It was a really, really great talk. And one of the elements in that talk was this notion of a maturity heuristic, a maturity heuristic for the kinds of work that we're doing on the web. Now, Leonard is an amazingly prolific and intelligent and amazing person. So there are two books that I'm just going to point out here. RESTful Web Services, which is really one of the key elements. That's the book that he released in 2008. It's one of the key elements for designing APIs. And then uh, RESTful Web APIs, which is sort of a, it's not a sequel, it's kind of in the same universe as RESTful Web Services, and I was lucky enough to help Leonard uh, on that second book. But uh, those are two books that I highly recommend you take a look at. Now, Leonard's maturity heuristic looked like this. He was talking about how amazing it was that we had at our disposal the stack of technology that would allow us to do amazing things, that we could address everything with the URI, we could use uh, methods to change or read or write those elements, and that we could actually embed instructions of URIs and methods into messages. That's what he called HTML hypermedia. Now, that's probably not the, the model that you're familiar with, when you think of Richardson's maturity model, you probably think of this one. This one is actually a rendering by Martin Fowler. When Martin sort of caught wind of what Leonard was working on, Martin kind of rewrote this in a little bit slightly different way, this idea of swamp of pox. This was not something that, uh, that uh, Leonard had talked about at all. Leonard had talked about the power of resources, verbs, and hypermedia controls. So we often hear this idea of, of swamp of pox and level one and level two and level three. That's not quite what uh, Leonard was talking about. And Leonard did not have any glory of rest idea in mind either. He was just talking about different technologies that rest on top of each other, so to speak. So he said, I did the maturity model because I noticed that each step corresponded to the adoption of a specific technology. That's really what Leonard was talking about. He wasn't making value judgments about what's good and what's bad and why zero is better than three and so on and so forth. He wasn't doing any of that. Now, I took the lead from Leonard when I was talking with Leonard, and, and we were talking about another aspect of it, and that is how we go about designing. Leonard was talking about how you implement and how you uh, implement resources. I was really talking about how you describe or model them. So I have a slightly different view of this, although I use the same sort of pattern. And we'll get into this database object resource affordance thinking here in just a minute. But I did this maturity model because I noticed that each step corresponded to the adoption of a specific model description language or a model description approach to expose that API. Because really what we have to do before we can use the API is we have to build it. Before we build it, we've got to design it. And before we design it, we have to model it. So there's these steps along the way. So I noticed that people were using sort of different models and, and they had a kind of a maturity to them. So uh, Leonard's model focuses on response documents 
My model focuses on description documents. Now, now this model's been around for a while. I first started talking about this around 2016, 2017. But uh, some people have sort of taken this notion that I was also trying to describe runtime. I was really trying to describe design time experiences, even if they're in real time. So let's talk about this. I really talk about this notion of database-centric and object-centric modeling of your APIs. And those are all internal models. Nobody on the outside knows what your database is. Nobody on the outside knows what your internal object model is, whether you, what code you're writing or anything like that. But there are also resource-centric and affordance-centric. That last one might be a little confusing. We'll talk about that in just a minute. These are very much external models. These model the externalities of your API, of your interface. So I can have customer resources or uh, sales resources or message resources. And I can have affordances inside messages that say this is how you add or delete or approve or submit or reject and so on and so forth. They're very much based on external elements. People care a lot about those because those are the ones they see. So let's talk first about this notion of internal modeling, database and object-centric view. So the data-centric version is the one that most people start with. Most APIs are actually based on this idea of just simply exposing the data model. So if you have customers uh, as a table, then you have customers as a resource. If you have uh, add, edit, and delete, then you have uh, uh, post, uh, put, and uh, delete, and get, and so on and so forth. It's often the go-to approach for many IT enterprises because it's very straightforward. As a matter of fact, there are lots and lots of tools, lots of off-the-shelf and software-as-a-service products that are basically based on this idea of just give me a data model, I'll give you an API. Um, now, there are lots of ways to model this. Uh, you may, it may be kind of hard to read on the screen, but this is an example of literally modeling a SQL database set of queries, turning them into routes, and then just running the query based on which route somebody picks. Um, GraphQL is a much more sophisticated version of that. Falcor is another example of these data-centric ways of modeling your interface. Now, there's virtually no design here. That's why I'm giving it a sort of zero on the level scale, because you're not really doing anything. You're just simply exposing what you have. Now, there are a lot of upsides to simply exposing what you have. It's quick and it's easy. You know exactly what you're gonna get. But there are some downsides. Often, your data model exposes a lot of your internal business elements, the way you name things, the relationship that they have, and so on and so forth. So by exposing your data model, you're actually exposing intellectual property to others also means you're tightly coupled. So if somebody changes the data model, changes a field name, adds a table, removes a table, uh, moves a field from one place to another, you're gonna break that interface. The interface is really tightly uh, tied to that particular data model. And you may have a rather sophisticated data model. So in the SQL sense, you may have group by or betweens or so on and so forth, where there's a lot of data work or joins and so on and so forth, transactions. These are very difficult to expose as elements in an API, especially on the web. In fact, what happens is often this is the easy way for providers to simply say, yes, we have an API. We sort of met the, met the uh, checkbox minimum and produce any costs of changes onto consumers. We'll change any time. You're just going to have to change along with it. That may work in small teams, but it's not how you run an internet business. It's not how you run a global enterprise. It's not how you make money if you keep changing and breaking all of the clients that are supposed to be paying you money. Now, uh, there's another great uh, person in the API space, Arachli Nadarishvili, who's written several books, and he has this great line. The first step in breaking the data-centric habit is to stop designing system as a collection of services and to focus more on business capabilities. Uh, Nadishvili's uh, got a lot of experience in building microservices and software systems, not just APIs. And this is really a key element. Exposing business capabilities is a real key, key element for moving on. Now, the second level uh, that I call level one is where you expose your object model. Now, this is also an internal model, but at least your object model is not your data model. So you could actually expose an object model and then change the data model and not break anything, right? This is very common for what was called a, a SOA or canonical model approach. Uh, this is a sort of a classic SOAP style implementation. So SOAP very much 
uh, exposed objects and actions that you can do on those objects. Here's an example of a description, a definition, which is uh, basically a SOAP description, and it has messages and so on and so forth, and URLs that are associated with each of them. Now, there is some design involved here, right? Because I'm designing objects, and I'm designing actions on those objects and arguments to pass back and forth. So we're going to give it a level one, and it's got several upsides. So there's lots of great tooling support. There's massive amounts of tooling for this object oriented, especially in the SOAP space world. Models can be built quickly. Um, you can focus them on use case, make them very rich. So they really focus on what people are trying to do, not on your data model or anything like that. So that's very powerful. And they can be very targeted for audiences. So whether you're an administrator, a user, a manager, whatever level you are in the stack. But there are still some downsides to this object oriented approach it's still tied to internal models. So changes to that in internal model can still leak out and break other people. If I start to rearrange my objects or rename my objects or change the relationship of my objects, my interface is immediately busted. So often the consumer model uh, for, your in for your data is not the same as your provider model. Think of uh, your mobile phone. Mobile phones don't need huge amounts of data that come out of a lot of object-oriented SOAP-based systems. They really want summary information. So now you have to have lots and lots of these object models. You've got to have sort of the, the mobile object model or the web object model or the desktop object model or the machine-to-machine -machine object model, and it gets really, really tough to scale. So coordinating providers and consumer models can be very heavy-handed. You may be forcing everyone to use the same model or everyone may be forcing the providers to adopt lots of models, and it can get hard to deal with. Now, one of the other things about modeling uh, that is a bit of a challenge is that uh, we really kind of took this idea of object modeling a little too far. Uh, I love this quote from Alan Kay, who's sort of considered one of the fathers of object model thinking. He said, I'm sorry that long ago I coined the term objects because he really thinks that's not the big idea. The big idea is messages that get passed between the objects. So it's message passing that becomes important. And message passing is really, really powerful in the web space as well. And that leads us to this notion of external models rather than internal models, resource-centric and affordance-centric. So resource-centric models um, actually are the way most AP APIs are built today, especially those that are HTTP style. It's very common for browsers and mobile development. So I have a customer resource, I have a sales resource, I have a user resource, I have a transaction resource, a banking resource, a credit resource, a debit resource. And there's lots of resource first products that are available. So Open API, RAML, Blueprint, all of these tools uh, all help you focus on a very resource oriented way of thinking about it. This is an example of a resource description in uh, uh, API Blueprint. I like API Blueprint a lot. It's currently uh, supported by Oracle, and there's lo there are lots of open source tools on it. So it actually understands a lot about HTTP, what's a delete, what's a put, what's a get, and then creates messages that you pass back and forth. What's a message that you receive, and what's the message that you send? So again, this is very much the Alan K story, right? It's making messages more important than the objects. So this has definitely uh, got some design work. This gets to level two in our little, uh, little panoply here. Uh, there's a lots of upside to this. You can focus on the interface. You focus on what the interface is, what the resources are, what the uh, objects, uh, what, the, what the response is, and so on and so forth. Often you can have a very consumer-centric fo focus when you do it right. What is it that the mobile object needs? It needs these fields, and so on and so forth. But there are still some downsides. A lot of times, these resource-centric elements reduce resources to, to overly simplified interfaces. So it's create, read, update, delete, crud, that's it. Even in HTTP, we've got dozens and dozens of methods, I think over 40 at the last time I looked. But we only use these four over and over and over again. So it, it gets really limiting and it forces people into some kind of goofy designs about how, how do you model something like approve or submit or share or upload or all these other things. And it's also very, very HTTP-centric, this idea of resources. Resources are not the same thing in HTTP as they are in WebSockets or Thrift or MQTT and all these other things. They're very message-oriented design, but they're not very resource-oriented design, right? So that's an issue as well. 
And then finally, even in this case where I say I got a customer resource and I've got a user resource and I've got a sales resource, they still leak objects or they still leak data elements. And often it requires what we call isomorphic models. Your system has to have the same model as my system does. And that can get really annoying over time. I don't need your model, I need my model, the way I look at the world, not the way the provider looks at the world. And this really leads to some of the key teachings in the, the book that taught us all about design patterns for object-oriented programming. It says you want to program to an interface, not an implementation. I might not be doing HTTP. I need a design that actually focuses on the interface, not the implementation details. And that's really important. And that leads us to what I call this level three, or affordance-centric development. An affordance is a thing that allows you to do something. Uh, a form affords you the ability to submit it and get data back, and so on and so forth. So this is an API expressed as structured messages that have affordances in them, forms and links, and so on and so forth. These are typically called hypermedia formats. So HTML and Uber and uh, Collection JSON and Siren and HAL and all these other ones are really, really common in this space. There are lots of them. React style also works very similar to this. I have certain things that I, actions that I know I can pass. I describe them and I send messages back and forth. So as I've already mentioned, there are lots of media types that are registered to, to support this kind of work. And I see lots of them today. Uh, HAL is used by uh, the Amazon system. Uh, uh, I've seen lots of Siren and Collection JSON. Atom is used a lot by uh, Microsoft tooling. So there's lots of stuff out there. Now again, this, is, this slide's kind of hard to read, but you can look at the example uh, when you look at the URL. This is a, an application level profile semantics or an ALPS document, which focuses on describing uh, elements and describing actions. So properties and actions all add up to very much an affordance-centric way of thinking about these things. Now this is very much an external design, so I can design an affordance experience. I can place affordances and responses that are specific to a particular user or a particular group of users. The focus is on the use case and the actions. People don't really care about your data, they care about what they can do with it. So this doesn't restrict to protocol, format, or workflow. I can do this in MQTT, I can do this in any reactive app, I can do this in WebSockets, I can do this in HTTP, all sorts of formats. Now there are some downsides to this. There aren't a lot of great tools and practices that are shared wildly, widely. Spring One, the people who were talking about this uh, the last time, that, that sort of uh, encouraged me to, to give this talk again, Spring One uses them quite often in their, in their RESTful tools, uh, but they don't appear in a lot of other places. And for machine-to-machine -machine cases, you really have to rely on code to give context to these forms. Why should I use this form? There's a whole nother level of describing the why in the semantic space, ontologies and vocabularies. We won't get into them today. But there are, there's some extra work that you have to do to actually make this work. However, the focus on actions over data means that there's a lot more reliance on this idea of shared vocabulary or shared dictionaries. And that's going to be a key element if you're going to want to make this work at the machine level scaled over time. So uh, I usually talk about Leonard, uh, Roy Fielding in the same conversations I talk about Leonard Richardson. And Roy has talked about this idea of how hypertext or hypermedia was really important. And he had this idea of how it presents both information and controls such as the information, the document you get back is the affordance that the user or the machine can use to obtain choices. So it's really using hypermedia to enable people to make choices. This takes a little bit more work and a little bit more planning, and that's why it's a little bit higher up on the scale. So I've talked about these, these four things. What does it really all boil down to? Well, think about it this way. When you're doing a data model, you focus on things like tables, customer invoice, customer visits, and you mix and match those when you need them. That's the same if you're doing a document database or if you're doing just a, sort of a GraphQL of merging lots of things. When you're doing an object model, you have a slightly different focus. You know, you want a customer summary object that maybe gives some basic infos and summaries and invoices and visits. And maybe you want to be able to read a summary or filter that summary object set or maybe update it or maybe suspend a particular uh, customer object in that collection. You think about things in a very different way. 
If you're thinking about resources, you're going to expose uh, that customer summary resource maybe with a customer ID. You might then link to invoices rather than include them in the object model. You might link to visits for customer visits and so on and so forth. So now you're creating a much more uh, interactive experience when you think about it from a resource model point of view. And then finally, if you really think about it from an interactive view, what you're going to do is you're going to collect up all of these actions and expose these actions to allow developers and other machines to actually decide what they want to do. Do they want a summary? Do they want to read? Do they want to filter? Do they want to search and suspend? And you simply expose each of these as actions as hypermedia actions, forms and controls, to do that work. And that leads to another way to think about this that I, that I like to encourage people to think about. This is what I call my API design maxim. Your data model is not the same as your object model, and your object model is not the same as your resource model, and your resource model is not the same as your affordance model. You can actually manage each of these independently. If I'm focusing on external formats for my interface, I can change my internal elements like object modeling and data modeling without bothering anybody. People don't have to change their clients at all as long as I keep honoring the interface that they have. Now, if my interface actually returns not just resources, but also returns the possible actions that go with it, now I can actually tell individuals what's possible at the next step. They can actually see the affordances inside the messages themselves. They don't have to write it into code. They actually can interpret it along the way. And that's a pretty wide range. That's a pretty tall order. And that's a lot of maturity to go through. Not every one of these options are for everyone. Not everyone is for every API. And you may be somewhere along where, there now. You may want to get to some other place in that mix, and that's totally fine. This is not a value judgment. It's just simply sort of a challenge space. And hopefully this has been an interesting talk. Uh, I, I'd like you to catch a lot of my other screencasts in this series, API Deep Dive. You can also see my uh, Design and Build Great Web API series. And I hope I get to see you again in another screencast. Thank you. <laughs>